you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to uh, all of you. I was just saying it to, uh, to Nuria. Um, very shortly, I'm just going to sit down and say, here's Nuria, and she can do it. And to several of the rep, Mandy, and some of you who have heard this uh, so often now that uh, I, I almost feel apologetic, uh, but you're the ones who came back. Remember, it's your fault. Uh, uh, and, and also, Elizabeth promised me uh, that uh, this morning uh, we could do some things that it's not been possible to do in more general sessions. And I think that's where we all uh, want to go. Uh, we are here at, in a graduate situation and professional clergy, uh, most of us. And um, I think there are things that we may be able to explore. One of the, uh, it's very difficult, I think, to um, get a better sense of what emergence is than to actually watch uh, some of the clips being put out by specialists in the subject of emergence. Um, let me begin by saying that the term emerge, there's been a great international conversation lately uh, about terms, uh, about whether it's, hi, about whether it's emergent or emerging or not emergence. And that's not just a rhetorical fight. Uh, it, wa it got to be, especially on Tall Skinny Kiwi, which is a, a big blog within the emergent movement, it got to be a real issue. Yeah, you're saying, yeah. Uh, Andrew Jones was really pissed <laughs> about the fact that we, we have a confusion of labels. And it was finally resolved to some extent by a fellow from Australia named Dick somebody, I don't remember his name, who said, labels do matter. Uh, that's the way I can tell dog food from cream of potato soup in my kitchen ca cabinet. Uh, and at that basis, we calmed down and everybody, and I thought it was a point well made, humorously made, but important. So uh, just to begin right now, let me be real clear that um, this thing started as emerging Christianity, and that was the label that went across the board. It started that way, but Brian McLaurin says, because he took a walk in the, in the forest one day and not knowing what it was that was going on and being terribly confused by all the things that were coming in, and he saw emerging up in the woodlands new spring growth, and he said, that's what we are. We are emerging. Uh, he did it with a kind of innocence that is regrettable, and he himself says that. Because what you've got overriding that is the great emergence, which is the social and, and political construct in which the times are. And he gave it without meaning to the same label so that we get emerging. And it spread around the globe. Uh, and, and we get emerging. And then we get the fact that there are emergent pe people coming up out of emerging Christianity. All emergence are emerging. Some of you look like this, and I don't blame you. If it didn't matter, it's the only way you're going to get the potato soup and the dog food separated, OK? Uh, really, all, all emergent Christians are emerging. Not all emerging Christians are emergent. And if you will remember church history, Lord help you if you do. But uh, anyway, if you remember those lovely years you spent in church history in this place, you will remember a thing called Marburg Castle. And you will remember that you know the Reformation wasn't out of diapers before uh, you have uh, Zwingli and Luther there at Marburg uh, fighting over who is what. Are we reforming? Are we protesting? Are we confessing? Uh, and, and separating with a good deal of viciousness, which was not hard to do with Luther. But nonetheless, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he grew up, but whatever. Uh, so that, uh, in fact, I think he left Marburg Castle saying of Zwingli, he was a big fat pig or something like that, uh, awful swine or something. Uh, and they never got along after that. They didn't get on. It seemed to have severed the relationship. In much the same way, there is a real tension between extreme end emerging and, frankly, emergent Christians. Uh, emerging at its extreme end is best personified by Mark Driscoll at uh, Mars Hill in Seattle. And if you don't, uh, New York Times did a sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I didn't do that. Uh, we're not videoing, are we, Jason? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Mr. Driscoll um, is um, very anti-feminist. Uh, he's very anti-gay. 
Uh, he's what I think we would call foundational or foundationalist uh, in his interpretation of scripture. So what makes him emerging? Well, he has all the other characteristics, and we'll be looking at those. And he's trying to solve it. At the opposite end probably is Rob Bell at Mars Hill in Granville, uh, or Grand Rapids, whichever one you want to call it, um, which is definitely uh, an emerging, emergent congregation in every way. And probably at the extreme end of emergent, you have things like Doug Paget at Solomon's Porch, or Quest uh, in Seattle with Eugene Chu. Or, uh, so you've got that confusion. Now, on top of it is what I just said, which is that the sociological and the political and the intellectual construct in which this is happening is also called the Great Emergence. And now we've got a religious presentation sharing a label, whether it wants to or not. And that's a problem. When we had the Reformation, we at least got Protestantism. And it's perfectly possible to have a decent secular lex uh, lecture about the Reformation and never mention Protestantism, because you can talk about all these other things. Unfortunately, this time, if you open your mouth with, about either one, an audience is 50% likely to hear the religion if you're talking about the sociology, or 50% likely to hear the sociology if you're talking about the religion. For that reason, increasingly over the last couple of months, I have tried to speak of emergence Christianity as an overarching, and I know it's rhetorical and it's a waste of time to have to listen to me for five minutes on this, but it, it matters. Uh, emergence Christianity is the Christianity coming out of the great emergence, and it runs a full spectrum. It goes from Mark Driscoll all the way over to people beyond Doug Paget. It's an adaptation, and we honestly don't know what it is. Now, having said that, if you want to just pick up your stuff and go home, I would understand it, because whatever this thing is, it's like trying to chase mercury on a chemistry lab counter. Uh, it, it won't sit down yet. We truly don't know what it is. Uh, but we do know it's there, and we can give its characteristics. And sometime in the next 25 years, we're probably going to know what it is. Now, the great emergence itself, the sociological, the intellectual, the domestic, uh, I will say some words about it. You probably know it already. But I, I ask Jason to show you a film clip. It's, it's a real short one. Uh, the, um, the Did You Know conference in Rome. There's a Did You Know conference uh, every year, and it was in Rome uh, in, in 08. Um, and they produce this film, which I think says in about three minutes uh, far more than, than 30 minutes worth of words would be. So if you will look at this in terms of a visual uh, representation or an attempt to describe what the great emergence as a secular phenomenon um, is, it's produced by people who really know. They, these are the theorists and the experts uh, in, in emergence. So um, I might add one thing here um, that I don't normally say to audiences, um, to, to, norm, you know, to normal audiences, to, to, non, <laughs> to non-professionals. Sorry about that. Uh, speaking as laity, uh, no. Uh, and, and that is that um, emergent theory, um, emergent theory was, um, was, is a matter of physics uh, also, uh, and, and of science. It is not, uh, religion and philosophy have co-opted it, all right, as, as a theory. Uh, and if you want to see George Henry Lewis uh, is the first uh, philosopher uh, to actually begin to talk about what emergent means when you lift it out of physical science and bring it into philosophy and into religion. Uh, so L-E-W-E-S is uh, a word. Uh, and you will find that the first expression of that theory comes from 1875, if memory serves me. That's right, 1875, when it is first articulated. Emergent, emergence theory and emergence and strong emergence happens when, the simplistically put, when the whole is larger than it, the sum of its parts. Uh, uh, simplistically, again, the Supreme Court is much larger than any single justice there. Any single justice lifted out of that lacks anything like what the whole has got. And yet together they are disparate parts disagreeing violently. But what the overarching thing is, is an emergent uh, phenomenon. You see it more often in ant hills or more commonly. Uh, it's the best biological example of what we're talking about. In an anthill, there is no leader. 
um, I can remember, I, I'm 75, or will be in about three weeks, and I can remember as a high school kid, they kept looking for the queen ant, uh, you know, like the queen bee. Uh, and there is no queen ant, we now know. Uh, there is no leader to an ant hill. The ants are self-organizing organism. That, and the ant hill is a result of the theories of self-organizing uh, organizations or something, uh, self-organizing entities, when they allow an emergent thing to come out of it, in this case, the ant hill. It is to say that the ants spray out behind them, we now know, pheromones. There is an odor that comes out of each ant. And each ant, as it passes in this frantic thing, or crawls over, as it, whatever it's doing, and it smells ants who are near food, because they've picked up a different pheromone, they will turn and all go toward the food until enough food has come back and the odor disappears, but the odor of garbage begins and they will all go over there and begin to lift out the garbage and take off the dead bodies and, do, and, and then over here they'll go hunting. That's how they do it. And they excrete the thing that eventually becomes the anthill. It's a totally disorganized organization. All right? So is the emergence Christianity we're going to be talking about. And if you're looking for organization, forget it, OK? This is very difficult for Episcopalians, all right? It is especially difficult for bishops. So if any of you are present, God help you for the next three hours. Uh, you're going to need help. Uh, but the underlying principle is uh, that this thing self-organizes. Now, it would not work if it weren't for the net. The only reason this thing works is because the net allows us to have that kind of instant exchange back and forth, totally open conversation, like the ants crawling all over each other. And if you don't feel crawled over every once in a while on your computer, there's something wrong with you. You're not getting the message because there are people crawling all, or you're not on Facebook with one or the other. Uh, <laughs> well, there are people crawling all over you all the time. Okay, with that kind of lead into what we're talking about when we talk about emergence theory, uh, and it is loose that brings it into psychology and philosophy. It's been uh, postulated, I think Aristotle was the first to postulate that there was such a thing. Uh, so, but it comes out of physical sciences. This is uh, last uh, October, I believe, in Rome uh, at the most recent, did you know, can you see, can the lights go up? I would like for you to be able to see this. Okay, because it really might, it's going to save us some words. There we go. Thank you. This is the report of the conference.
Thank you very much. Uh, at watching it, I realized that uh, that's the hyperlink to the uh, original conversation uh, and not the 208 one, but that's, that's okay. It does the same thing. Uh, obviously, the, the questions are not uh, to your school board, but to your vestry. Uh, they are not to the teacher, but they're to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and uh, how, how are you going to... Um, how are you going to prepare people for this? Um, the uh, science is there, the, refer the uh, references to the exponential growth of uh, information uh, is based on what's called Moore's Law, M-O-O-R-E apostrophe S, Moore's Law, which you probably need to Google and look at. 
Moore's Law uh, has been in place now for about 10 years. And it says that, that uh, compu computational ability um, grows, doubles, uh, every two years. Um, and as you saw up there, it is now uh, predicted that uh, computational abilities will grow um, every seven, double every 72 hours uh, by the time we get to 2025. What, uh-huh? I'm sorry, Coach. I assume that video is online. It is. Yes, it is. And YouTube, ha all you have to put, put in is the Did You Know Conference Rome, and you'll get it on YouTube with some jazzy music. I'm, it's my, I sent the wrong, uh, obviously. The, uh, it's not wrong. Uh, it's just not the most recent uh, uh, hyperlink or URL. But go to YouTube and put in Did You Know Conference Rome. 2008. But if you put the Rome in, you'll get the 2008. Um, the uh, Moore's Law thing matters um, primarily uh, because one of the things that we'll be talking about, and many of you have already heard me, and if you've read the book, you know it, one of the major questions of what we're going through right now is the fact that we don't know what it means to be human. Uh, we have uh, no, no definition of humanity um, and of what humanness is. Uh, and part of our traditional definition has been the ability uh, to assume that our skin was impenetrable, um, that we were a self-contained unit within our skin, uh, and uh, that everything that happened out of us came out of, out of that skin or was controlled within that internal environment. Um, that will not be true. That's not true now, as a matter of fact. Uh, you already are downloading. If I say to you very quickly, multiply 60 by 48, you're going to reach for your iPhone. Uh, you know, uh, you've already downloaded mathematical skills. That's just how that is. Um, but uh, by, by Moore's Law and by what's happening, the truth of it is that we're going to have to download. We're going to have to download because we can't possibly keep up with the computational needs uh, of, a, of a society, uh, which is to say that one of the things, again, um, that you might want to look at is the China Brain Project. It's hyphenated, China Brain Project. Um, China Brain Project is funded by the Chinese government. Uh, Hugo de Garvis is the head scientist on it. It's well on its way. It's based on a plain old PC, just a plain old laptop PC, um, that uh, sometime between now and the next three years will produce um, a, a mentation that is not only far in excess of our own ability, um, but also will be uh, capable of emotions. Uh, and when, yeah, when uh, the machine moves over to the emotion, uh, we are into cyborgs. Uh, we are into Ray Kurzweil. Uh, and people have laughed at Kurzweil for years, and it looks like the joke may be on him. So again, um, you might want to look at Artificial General Intelligence, AGI, um, which is a asso very active association of scientists uh, in this country, computational scientists in this country. Uh, they're getting huge support from FedEx, uh, and I suspect from UPS, though I don't know that. I know they're getting it from FedEx. I can just see it now. Sometime in the next 20 years, the man in the little brown shorts will have 10 legs and a 10 hand, and he will come to your door and deliver your, your ups uh, and your FedEx, which is exactly why we're talking about robotics. And when robotics picks up emotion, then where indeed is the human being? And when the human being has to have the machine in order to be completely human, where indeed? And then one last uh, little annoying fact is that in May, and that was when I first realized that I sent the wrong URL, in May uh, the petaflop uh, was passed uh, by Roadrunner. Roadrunner is a huge computer that is the property of IBM and the U.S. government. Uh, and the petaflop, not that I know a thing about what I'm telling you, but the petaflop by definition is that uh, that machine can now make over a quadrillion uh, computations successfully in one second, um, which is part of what the, the clip was talking about. We can't do that. We will never do that. Our neurology for doing that just isn't there. It ain't going to happen. Uh, there's not enough stuff in our head to be able to pull that off. We're going to have to download. Uh, and the truth of it is, if we don't get started in ethics, and if seminaries like this one don't get started in ethics, and I was appalled when uh, AGI had its first international meeting to talk about the China Brain Project in May in Memphis, there was not a single clergy person there, and they dedicated the last hour of that conference, the last hour of a three-day conference, to the ethics involved here. And the truth, I mean, I love it, you know, uh, but the truth of the thing is, we're not going to stop the progress of this kind of science. We're just not. 
It's, it's, it's a tsunami. It's going to go. It's part of what we're in. If we don't begin to engage it ethically, somebody who's not ethical is going to because there's a huge, one of the shifts from Great Reformation to Great Emergence is Great Reformation established money as the, as the, as the base of power. The Great Emergent has established technology as the base of power. And information, he who knows the most and has the most toys wins the game. And that's a huge shift. Now, having said that, Elizabeth came up while we were watching and, uh, the clip and asked me to say one thing she had forgotten to say, which is we are indeed being videoed. Um, and if any of you, when we get around to having a uh, conversation together, if any of you wishes to um, not be on camera, if you will signal me, uh, we will cut the cameras or uh, blot out your face or, or not use your name or something. Um, we have learned to do that in emergent meetings uh, and emergence Christianity meetings because many of the times the people who come cannot afford to be seen uh, on camera lest their position in a non-emergence church uh, be, be seen as threatened in some way. So uh, if there is a, a problem for any of you, please let us know and we will accommodate by, by killing the camera for a minute. All right, now having done all of that, I want to indeed take you back to that lovely course in church history. Um, and I want to tell you things you know. Basically, all morning I'm going to be telling you things you already know. Uh, isn't that encouraging? I just hope we'll put them together in a, in a slightly different way. I want to take you back to 1390. And I want to say to you that in 1390, by 1390, we have three popes, three contenders for the chair of Peter, wandering around all over Europe, all over the southern part of Europe. Now, actually, we have had a man die in, in 1384, 1386, named John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe uh, is called by most people the morning, M-O-R-N, the morning star uh, of the Reformation. Simply because if you, if you really need to look at where the Perry Reformation begins, you can make a good case that it, be, it, that it begins with Wycliffe. I am more comfortable saying by, three, by 1390 when you've got all the, the contenders for the Pope. But Wycliffe is very often cited. It was not that he really wanted to give people a Bible so much as he was a political animal who thought that England was emerging as a nation state uh, and that it ought, therefore, to have its own vernacular edition of the Bible. There's a difference. His was a political motivation. It was not a religious motivation. By the time we've got thir uh, three popes running around in, th in 1390, we can see the beginning of a real attack upon the authority of Rome. Up until then, people have picked at it and pocked at it. Every time we go through one of these things, there's about a 250-year period of stasis in here, and that 250-year period was ending uh, in 1390. The 250 years of stasis means that we all know where the authority is. We may not like it, but we know where it is, and we trust it to be strong enough to take everything as we kick it and damn it and, and bludgeon it to death. But then there comes that magic moment, and 1390 is the magic moment, when suddenly you realize there's three people running around saying they are the heirs of Peter. How can that be? We've heard of a trinity, but this is excessive. You know? uh, uh, and it doesn't take a genius uh, to begin to understand. You, don't even, you can be John Q. Serb somewhere, uh, and, and, and you begin to realize there is something wrong. By the time you get to 1414 and the Council of Constance, uh, which goes till 1418, um, I don't want to, you can't do this with lay audiences, and I don't want to beleaguer you all with things that you passed and got out of here with and didn't have to worry, but, but it's important that uh, by the time you get to the Council of Constance, you've got the, the, the authority, uh, that is the Roman Catholicism, saying, whoa, we don't like the drift here. We're going to try to, and it was the Council of Constance, if you will remember, who probably made Wycliffe the, the morning star of the Reformation because they went and dug him up. Uh, I love it. They dug him up, they burned what was there, and then they threw it in the river. That's real Christian charity. I love that. I love that. You know? But it did position him as, as something of a pivotal point. When you go from uh, the Council of Constance, then you get bang, bang, bang. What you've got is 150 years of tick-up, which is called the Perry Reformation 
we've had a peri-emergence that we'll look at in a minute. But if you look at the peri-reformation from 1390 right up to 1517 when everybody could say, hey, we are in this thing. This, this is now something we can put our fingers on. But that 150 years is filled with all kinds of things that first of all attack the authority of Rome. They attack it uh, on, from every side. You've got everything from the printing press, uh, and, and you know, this idiot takes a, he takes a perfectly good wine press and puts paper in it instead of grapes. He was obviously not an Episcopalian. We would never, you know, we would never create such sacrilege, but anyway, he does it. You get the Mazarin Bible in 1459 uh, beginning to circulate. You get the fall of Constantinople. Uh, and when Constantinople falls uh, in the 1450s, you suddenly are inundated with Greek reading and Hebrew reading scholars who bring back into Europe all of the classical languages that have been lost and all of the classical writers that had been lost to Europe. And suddenly we are inundated in information we didn't know we had. Uh, you, you've got uh, the, the spread of Islam. You've got uh, all of that happening in 1492, including the fact the fact that Columbus, like it or not, sailed west and he didn't fall off. Uh, and, and that matters. And it's really a question how many people truly thought the world was flat by the time uh, Columbus actually did it. Nonetheless, he did it. And the reason it matters is that in a round world, like in a layered world, here's hell and here's the earth and here's heaven. When you round the puppy, here's clearly hell, but you've got a round thing. Now, you tell me. If Jesus ascended in Jerusalem and around wall, what happens to me if I descend, uh, ascend over here in Great Britain? Or God help me, what would happen if I ascended over here in India? We would obviously shoot off into entirely different directions. This is not good. This is definitely not good. So there's a theological problem. Uh, you've, you've, got, uh, you've got the breakdown, of course, of the surf system. Uh, and, and the growth of the nation state, uh, not the least of the Perry uh, Reformation, was the importation of gunpowder um, into Europe. Uh, and when gunpowder comes in, uh, it's very clear that anybody who's got enough money, and most of the lords of the manor were land rich and, and cash poor, because up until this time, uh, it had been land that made you wealthy. Uh, now they've got very little cash. And it's very clear that whoever has got enough cash to buy the gunpowder can shoot with a gun quickly and take over the next guy's land because a gun will trump a bow and arrow every single time. And so what you get is the amalgamation of two manners together in order to have enough coin to be able to afford the gunpowder. And then they pick up the third. And the first thing you know, you've got a duchy, or you've got a province, or you've got a dukedom, or you've got uh, something that ultimately is going to become a nation state. All of that is changing. You've got Copernicus coming along, bless his heart, uh, you know, saying that, uh, the, that we're, we're, we're sitting here, and, and, and we're we're going around. We're, we're going around the sun. The sun isn't going around us. We're not the center of the universe. This is very upsetting. So it's bang, bang, bang. As these things are happening, and you know all of them, and there, there are about three dozen. We could stand here and do it, but you know them all. There's no point in beating a dead horse. Uh, by, the, by the time all this has happened, what you've got is a huge attack on the established authority. The authority from the Great Schism in the 11th century, 1054, up until 1390 is clearly the papacy. Clearly Rome controls it. From 1390 up to 1517, you've got whittling away of significant proportions against the authority of Rome. Leaving Martin Luther and his company in 1517 with the prime question, where now is the authority? Where now are you going to put it? Now, I started with the Reformation because it's more familiar, and because it's so familiar, you can be flip about it uh, to some extent. Um, but, but I want to show you a pattern. And that pattern is that every 500 years, we go through one of these things. And these things have a pattern internal to themselves. That is to say, if you go back from where we are right now, which I can't do yet, OK. We are, as you all know, because you've read the book and you're here to do this, we are in the great emergence. 
The one just before us was the Great Reformation. And one just before that was the Great Schism or Schism, according to what your mama taught you. I still say it's an itchy word. I don't care which way you say it. It makes me want to scratch my backside for some reason. I don't know what it is about schism, but it does. It affects me physiologically. Uh, but uh, uh, this one's 1054 is a convenient date. Uh, this one is 1517. This one, increasingly people are saying, is probably going to be 911, uh, which is an aberration and would not have happened had it been a less dramatic event. In each, and, and we can go back to the great decline and fall. And before that, the Great Transformation. Now, as I think has to be said, even to the point of tedium, um, first of all, the Great Transformation really originally as a term, not that anybody can read it, but uh, uh, truly meant uh, something uh, much more, much broader than just that period of the change from, common, from uh, before common era to common era. After Karen Armstrong's book, The Great Transformation, came out, in which she talks about 2,000 years of history before this, why it got corrupted, I don't know. Somehow that book did well enough so that the label slipped over to mean that time of period between before Common Era and, and Common Era. So, so be it. When I was uh, doing The Great Emergence, for those of you who have read it, um, I laughingly said, I, I'm so fascinated by our absorption with greats. I mean, you know, it is so American, uh, and we've corrupted the Brits and their colonies with it. I was so amused by all the greats that I flippantly said, and one should never be flip in a book. I know that. Uh, I should know it. You should never be flip in a religion book, especially. Uh, and I flippantly said, oh, if this is the age of Gregory the Great. Well, half of the UK rose up in horror. Uh, I never, you know, the Internet is wonderful until it gets on your case, and then you just, you know, <laughs> My, I, I almost wore delete out, thinking already I got the, the message. Um, the, uh, and, and what I had said was Gregory the Great. Uh, and Gregory the Great is the one who cleaned up the mess, and that's what I said. Uh, Gregory the Great comes to the papal throne in 590. Uh, it is he, of course, who wants to colonize the British colonies, uh, who uh, sends... Uh, you know, uh, gets us Augustine to go over there, and, and uh, so we become Anglicans uh, at that point. But Gregory the Great cleans it up, and, and my British critics were absolutely right. The, it's, the, it's the time of Leo the Great, and I should never have, I should never have cut that corner. Uh, Leo the Great is the pope who is sitting in 410, or when for the first time the walls of Rome are pierced uh, by uh, Attila. Uh, Ehrlich, I'm sorry, Ehrlich. Uh, and in 411, uh, he actually is outside uh, negotiating, trying to save the city. It is Gregory, it is Leo the Great, uh, who is the sitting pope when we had the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, and he does indeed, and that's 451, and in 452, uh, then Leo is outside the gates uh, with gold, a bucket of gold, a wagon load of gold. Uh, negotiating with Attila, uh, and, and he buys Rome uh, about 30 years. Uh, and of course, in 480, the city actually falls. In 480, the Senate dissolves itself, saying there is no more imperium to rule, uh, and it is all over. In general, the great decline and fall, I think, had been probably set right at 500. 500 is the year that St. Benedict uh, turned 20. Uh, and uh, went out to Monte Cassino, and the monastic movement was off and running. And it would be, uh, of course, from the Great Schism to the Great Reformation, it is going to be the monasteries where the authority is. It's going to be in the monastic system. Uh, just as uh, here it had been, well, I'm sorry, put it in the wrong place, beg your pardon, here. Uh, just as here it has been the Apostolic Fathers uh, who were uh, the source of authority. Uh, so that uh, this, this period is Leo the Great, if you want to, or more easily, probably, after Edward Gibbon, called the Great Decline and Fall. And that keeps the Great pure, and it, it makes it clear what we're talking about. So in each of these 500 periods, though, there is a thing. There is a tick-up. There is the Perry whatever. 
In this case, the peri-reformation. In our case, the peri-emergence. The peri lasts about 150 years. Every time you can clock it, it's about 150 years. When the thing itself happens, when the event happens, when we get to, to uh, 1517 or to 1054 or whatever, there is a period of about 100 years of settling in, of figuring out exactly what's going on. And then you have that stasis, I call it, that period of tranquility of about 250 years. And that makes your 500-year cycle. The Perrys will be about 150 years, and they have a pattern to them. Uh, we'll be looking at that in a minute. The time of stasis will be about 250 years. When we know what the authority is, uh, we, we may not like it, but we know it's there. And there's about 100 years after the date when the thing is clearly in progress while we try to shake it out, which is to say that we're going to be shaking this one out, obviously, uh, for the rest of this century in all probability, trying to figure out what it is that, that we've got going. Now, when I do this, there is a certain cycles are, uh, cycles are the bane of academic uh, education. Cycles uh, can sometimes simplify or reduce to simplicity things that, don't, that are too complex to go there. This is painting with a broad brush. Painting with a broad brush is very, very helpful as long as the brush paints true, all right? But you can particularize it so much that it loses its utility. So a word of caution that we're looking at things that are irrefutably there. You, you can't make this up. Uh, they're irrefutably there. But remember their broad brush uh, and, and keep them in that. The second thing that needs to be said right here is that this same business of 500-year cycles also happens in Judaism. It is not a Christian phenomenon. It happens in societies where Christianity and Judaism exist. It is not inherent, perhaps, in, in Judaism, or I'm not convinced it is, but a good rabbi will say, ah, it is inherent in Judaism and in the societies that Judaism informs, because if you go back 500 years from this one right here, you hit the Babylonian captivity, and if you go 500 years back from this one, you hit the end of the Age of Judges and the beginning of the Davidic dynasty out of which Mesha was to come. There is also apparently a 500-year cycling. This makes me very nervous. A 500-year cycling within Islam itself. Good Islam, and I don't know enough about Islamic history to even begin to start to go there. Uh, but I'm assured by those who are that there is a 500-year cycling within Islam, although it's off by 150 years, 125 years, uh, because of the time of Islam's founding. So what have we got? Have we got a Christian phenomenon in which we say that the societies in which Christianity is the dominant religion go through a thing because of Christianity or because that's native to the cultures that are willing to accept Christianity? I don't know. Uh, do we have something that is Judeo-Christian because much of Judaism's influence in the, in the last centuries or so has been connected with Christianity and Christian cultures? Or do we have an Abrahamic one? I don't know and I don't think anybody else knows and I'd be real nervous if anybody got too far out there. Now, the other thing we have to say is that from here on in, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about anyway, is the world of Latin Christianity. That is to say, as, as you all know, I can't draw Europe, so why should I try? Uh, as, as we, as, I can't draw anything. Uh, as, as, as we all know, there were three major divisions in the first century, if you will. There were divisions on the basis of language, which means on the basis of culture also, obviously. Language determines culture, and culture determines language. That is to say, there was that division which we call the Nestorians or the Jacobites or the Syriac Christians or there are any kind of n number of names for them. They become Oriental Christianity. They were a huge part of early, early Christianity. Tatian, to whom I want to go shortly, Tatian was writing in the Syriac language. He was a Syriac Christian when he did the Diatessaron. So that when, when uh, Timothy the Great became Catholicus in 780, uh, Catholicus for uh, the Nestorians or for the Syriac church, 
under his Episcopal oversight, was close to a third of all Christians that were extant in, in the 8th century, in the 9th century. That's how large it was. It, it got drummed out. We drummed it out. We got rid of it right here at, where did I do it? Uh, right here at Chalcedon. I lost Chalcedon. Under the under, here it goes. There you go. We drummed, what we did in the Latin experience, that is those of us who had our principal scriptures coming in the Latin language, uh, managed to get rid of uh, Oriental. And we just drummed it out and we sent it off. And this is why this makes me nervous. We sent it off to an area of the world that uh, was to become Islamic, was already uh, becoming Islamic. It was essentially um, ended by its conflict with Islam. Uh, in the, the early part of the last century, the Armenian Holocaust uh, was perhaps the most uh, familiar uh, of, of what Islam is a language and a religion of peace where it's not the majority. Once it becomes the majority, um, it is not a religion of peace. Uh, and um, it's important, I think, as we try to help our people in going through, because one of the questions is not just what does it mean to be human, but another of the questions is give us a theology of religion. Show us how to live in, in a polyreligious world. And, and to deny the fact here of what has happened is to be unfair to our people and to live dangerously. Now, can it be fixed? I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is to say, here are the facts, Jack. It's your problem to deal with them. I love that. That's what academics are really good at. You know, they just say, here you are. Here's your diploma. God, you know, God bless you and good luck. Uh, but, and send the check. But, uh, <laughs> I feel like, but, it, it's there, and, and that's what happens. So that Oriental Christianity, which is the direct descendant of Syriac Christianity, Oriental Christianity is now beginning to grow a little bit. Uh, we call it the Coptic Church or the Ethiopian Church. It's beginning to, to grow to some extent. But there is a problem here. Uh, and Alan Jones, dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, when he gets right here, says, what really matters in a theology of religion, when the rubber hits the road, is this one question, if you're in charge, will I be safe? Uh, I mean, Alan's good at, at killing them, right? And anything you tell your people about multi-faith is going to have to ultimately face Dean Jones's test. Uh, and he will look you in the face and say, if you're Islamic, I'm probably not uh, safe. And uh, so we need to be aware of that. The second stream coming out of early, early church, of course, was the Orthodox one. Um, they spoke uh, Greek, um, as you, no surprise uh, there, uh, and uh, we got rid of them at the Great Schism, we being the Latins. Um, and uh, if, if you will remember, uh, the fight was over a whole lot of things. Uh, uh, the fight was certainly over far more uh, than what kind of Christianity we were going to have. Um, the fight was over things like it was ultimately going to be the thing called the Crusades. You may have heard of those. Uh, they were very. By the way, let us say Anselm of Canterbury was the only bishop, the only bishop who opposed those Crusades. Let's hear it for the Anglicans. Uh, you know, uh, he was our boy. Of course, he also gave us the atonement, which we'll get to in a minute. But that's all right. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but he's the one who stood up and said this is wrong, but he wasn't heard. So there were cultural, there were political, there were all kinds of. Of problems happening uh, when we got around to the Great Schism. But the Christian presentation of it was that the Latin church and, and the Greek-speaking church decided to separate. Uh, and out of it, we got pure, uh, an absolute purity of our scripture in the Latin language, which is why we're called the Latin church. It does not mean Roman Catholic. It just means our principal scriptures came to us out of the Latin language. When that happened, everything, I mean, we lost everything except the false Halloran uh, and the Kyrie. Uh, it was the, and, and the false Halloran is just a title to something, right? You know, uh, and, and the Kyrie is when the priest gets really uppity on Easter, uh, and we have to do that, and we think we're doing something wonderful. Uh, you know, but, but that's it. Those are the residuals. Uh, 
I do love the fact that uh, now on Easter Sunday, more and more of our, our congregations anyway are having sweet bread. How sweet it is. Uh, you know, because part of the fight was can you have sweet bread uh, for the communion or does it have to be that nasty unleavened flat stuff that the Jews fled to Egypt, uh, fled Egypt from, whatever. Uh, the filioque has kind of died or withered away. Um, and, and we no longer wonder about whether the Trinity is upside down triangle or right side up one, uh, much, and we kind of do it what, however our local bishop says we can do it and go on. So all of, the, all of the bones of contention are gone, but what emerges out of it then is the Latin church. The Greek church, like the Oriental church or the Syriac church or whatever, begins to suffer because it too is a la in, in, in physical lands, in geography, that is occupied by Islam. And it, too, will be uh, suppressed uh, in many ways by the growth of Islam. And that's just a fact of history. Uh, Constantinople, when it fell, uh, was um, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, uh, driving out uh, the Greek population. And, and that's exactly what that was about. Uh, and much of the trouble at the Great Schism was, of course, the conflict with Islam. Um, and uh, so, and it, it was not entirely solved by the Great Reformation, as you probably know. Uh, the uh, Islam invaded. Uh, continental Europe, at least uh, eastern part of Europe. Uh, and uh, the last time they were successful was in the year 1678 when they got as far as Vienna and burned uh, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the city. Uh, so it's, it's not like, uh, you know, it's, it's gone away. But nonetheless, um, those three divisions are there. What I'm talking about from here on in is Latin Christianity. That does not say that there's not the same sort of pattern in orthodoxy or in oriental orthodoxy. I just don't know a thing about that. Uh, it may very well be, but what we're concerned about right now is this. And whether it happens because we, by some magic, inform our societies in such a way that they solidify, or whether they solidify and we're just caught as being part of the social construct, I don't know. Which, which comes first, the chicken or the eggs? I do know that every time we go through one of these huge things, these tsunamis, these secular events, we have a concomitant change in Christianity. And we are going through one right now. And that basically is the point. All right, now then, uh, see, I want to go, we're, we're to 10 o'clock. Uh, we're to a little after 10. Um, can you make it another 20 minutes? OK, all right, if you can make it another 20 minutes. I don't know how many of you uh, have, have read The Great Emergence. I don't want to waste time rebuilding the tick up if it's already in your heads. I don't want anybody to lie, but have you read it? Yes. Okay, all right, you know, you know where we are. Okay. Uh, read it so many I, I don't even, I've heard it so many times I don't even want to hear it again, she says. Uh, <laughs> that's true. All right. The tick up is, is, is there. Uh, and one, uh, one or two of the things that one does not necessarily do with general audiences is that, of course, um, in, in the tick up, and not really talked about much, uh, is the fact that you get Das Kapitas uh, in 1869. And communism uh, is a big uh, part of the evidence of, of the tick up. Uh, it's an attempt to restructure uh, civil government in such a way. Now, what happened is that uh, Luther, when he stands there in 1517, and he has managed to decapitate, more or less, uh, the pope, when he has cried, no more magisterium, no more curia, uh, no more Vatican, when he has managed to do that, and he's left with the question, where now is the authority? Because if you've read the book, you know always the central question in every one of these is, where now is the authority? You got rid of the pope. Well, bully for you. The pope got rid of the, of the patriarch uh, and, and got rid of the monasteries. And before that, the monasteries got rid of the apostolic fathers. But you've got to put something in its place. Where now is the authority every time? For us, there are three subordinate questions. The first of which is, I said, the nature of humanity. What does it mean to be human? What are we? And we'll come back to this one at some point. The second is a theology of religion. How do we live in a multi-religious world? And the third is uh, substitutionary death, the nature of the atonement, 
um, and it devolves very quickly into pure theodicy uh, as it gets talked about in, in, uh, in common conversation. You and I would recognize it as, as pure theodicy. Now, uh, Luther is standing there, and he's got no pope. He just sort of knocked him dead. Uh, so what has he got? He's got nothing except scripture. I love that, nothing except, don't you? Uh, nothing except scripture. And so he comes up with sola scriptura. And we can laugh about it, but the truth of it is he took a human pope and replaced him with a paper pope. That's exactly <laughs> what happened, uh, you know. And he took Peter with the concept of the beloved community and substituted Paul. And this, again, is something I don't do with lay audiences much, but, but it's important. Peter, Peter was so associated with Rome that Peter had to go. That was the first reason, OK? He's buried in the middle of the sucker, for one thing. You know, I've called out in that hole, and I bet half of you have too, to visit the old boy, or what's left of him. Uh, so that Peter had to go because Rome is the chair of Peter. Rome is the vicarage of Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter. Yet it was Peter to whom our Lord delivered the beginning of the concept of the beloved community. The beginning of, on this rock I found my church. We all know that. But what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. There is only one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's going to be corrupted right on up to indulgences. We all know that. But that's our fault and not Scripture's fault. But nonetheless, Peter had to go. That's the first reason he had to go. The second is that we desperately, or Luther, desperately needed Paul. Paul is pharisaical in training, which is fine. He is standing there. He argues out of his head the principles of scripture. He is a distillate of the gospel. It can be got this way. And one of the most fascinating things about the transition is while Wycliffe may have had no desire to create a new scripture, it is very clear that Erasmus did. And Erasmus wanted one, and a man named Robertus Stephanus, a Parisian printmaker and, and printer, uh, began, was the first to begin to print Bibles that had something like verses in them, something like what we've got now. And by 1560, you've got the Geneva Bible, which is broken into incredibly awkward verses. And it's not that we've never had some paragraphing, because by, by the time the Reformation begins to happen, there's the beginning of some paragraphing, even in Jewish scriptures, not much. But to actually break it into verses really begins with the, uh, the Geneva Bible is the first. And by the time you get to the King James Bible, you've got what we've got now. Why does that matter? If you've looked at some of the versification, uh, first of all, if you can imagine a time when they weren't there, how sweet it is. Uh, and, and one of the things that's happening right now is the, pres the publication of Bibles that have all of that Geneva and King James stuff taken out, gone back to paragraphs. We'll get to that in a minute. But why does that matter? It matters because if you are arguing theology, if you, for the first time, are able to argue theology, you need to be able to cite, quote, chapter and verse. And that's where it came from. In the, and because Luther had to have it. He could not bear the beloved community. I mean, can you imagine Luther running around with a beloved community? They'd eat him alive or he'd beat them to death, one or the other. Uh, you know, uh, couldn't tolerate it, couldn't tolerate it. And so it, the old joke that the Reformation moved Christianity north is not talking about Scotland and Geneva it's ta and Switzerland. It's talking about the fact that we went from here to here. And it was a necessary shift. It was a counter-reaction, if you will, uh, to too much of the ooey-gooey stuff uh, that, that had been Rome's approach to it. So we get, we get the beginning then of, of solus, we get the assertion of sola scriptura, and we begin to get the adaptation of scripture to fit the need for the time, to fit the purposes of argumentation. Now, a sidebar that I never do, uh, obviously, with, with lay audiences is that the minute you do that, not only do you have the priesthood of all believers, because you've got to be able to, for this to work, John Q. Public's got to be able to read. 
That's just how that is. It does not work if he or she cannot read. The minute you get universal literacy, uh, then you get universal chaos. Uh, that is to say, you teach everybody to read, and you give them the same thing to read, and what's going to happen is you're going to get two and a half different opinions about every single verse there. And, and the two are fine, because they, they're clean. they got a partner. It's the half rolling around like a loose ball on a billiard table that's going to knock everything until it finds its mate. So that divisiveness is Luther's great gift, or is the Reformation's great gift to Western thought. Universal literacy is a great gift, but it brought with it also divisiveness. So what we have got now, it, well, what we have in this country is 27,600 and something, I can't remember the final number, uh, separate and distinct Protestant denominations, all recognized by the IRS for purposes of tax exemption. That's divisive. That really, honest to goodness, is, is divisive. Now, when, when that happens, for the first time, you have to be a, and, and that's a bit of an exaggeration. Let me, let me say, when I say first time, I'm going to come back and clean up my act here. But effectively speaking, for the first time, you've got the beginning of creeds that you have to sign off on. Uh, that's not to say that there wasn't a debatch. There's not to say that there wasn't Nicaea, that the, the Apostles' Creed. Those things were there. They're a lot less deadly than the Westminster Short Confession, which God knows if it were all the way would kill you, you know. Uh, it would sure weight you down. It would be like being pressed in 16th century uh, jail or something. Uh, so when you get creeds, when you can separate Zwingli, for instance, from Calvin, or Calvin from Luther, or, or any number, when you begin to get that divisiveness and that clarification of what we believe out of sola scriptura, you get the professionalization of the clergy. And that matters enormously to everybody in this room. And that's where I don't go with uh, um, uh, lay audiences because it doesn't matter. Now, prior to that, under the Roman system, under the Roman Catholic system that had been overthrown by the Reformation, the local clergyman was not necessarily uh, even a man of God. He was an agent of the state because one of the things, the one, one of the, the, the most important characteristic of Latin Christianity, other than it speaks Latin instead of Greek or Syriac, the most important or informing or pivotal characteristic about it is that from the get-go it got in bed with the state. Ying and yang, wife and husband, and the Milvian Bridge should never have happened, uh, but it did. And 337 should never have happened, but it did. God knows Christmas Eve 800 when Charlemagne is made, you know, by the Pope, Holy Roman Emperor. Those should not have happened. The other two branches of Christianity came up in a society where they were not. They could cohabit with the state, but they were not regarded as handmaiden to the state, and the state as handmaiden to the church. We have been. As a result, from, from the whole period of the supremacy of Roman Catholicism, it is informed by a clergy that functions many ways like public officials requiring no theological background for many of them. Now, at the same time that I'm making this broad statement, we've also got people like Thomas Aquinas running around who are doing pretty well. You know, it's, it's not like we're dealing with fools and idiots. But the, the people in the village square where Tom was not, he was too big to get out of bed. But anyway, that's a different issue. Uh, <laughs> he liked Coca-Cola. No, um, the, um, the, the village square w was a state official as much as he was a church official. Uh, and uh, he, he could be as ribald as he wished, and we all know out of medieval literature uh, some of the interesting uh, characterizations. Of, but you get with this thing, with this coming of Sola, you get the professionalization of the clergy, and you can watch it. One of the things Luther asked for was seminaries. He was very clear that what was wrong, one of the things that was wrong was an uneducated clergy, and the Council of Trent gave him that. I mean, uh, the, the Roman church cleaned up its act, put in seminaries. It's not like they don't have them. But basically, seminaries are a Protestant phenomenon. Now, one of the things we are, I hate that Gary had to go, that was a call from somebody, the devil called him or something, because I wanted to, <laughs> I'm leading up to this, and now I'm talking to the empty chair. Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> when we say we're in the great emergence, we also say we are post-denominational, we are post-literate, we are post-enlightenment, we are post-rational, we are post-Protestant, and, oh, we are post-Protestant. <laughs> the professionalized clergy, the professionalized clergy in the usual sense 
is a Protestant phenomenon, and it's going to stay that way. This is not to tell you you need to go file for unemployment immediately. It is to say uh, that there is a change in paradigm here. And the change in paradigm has to do with the fact Protestantism is not going to die. Um, it just did. Roman Catholicism did not die uh, with, uh, with the Reformation. Oriental Christianity did not die with Chalcedon. That's not true. They had, each time that we've gone through one of these, whatever held hegemony, whatever held hot pride of place, has had to drop back and reconfigure and refigure what it's doing. And then it goes on. And each time it is equally true that Christianity has spread. There's no reason to be miserable about this thing. It is, though, to recognize that professionalized clergy is a part of Protestantism. Non-professionalized clergy is emergence Christianity. They are leaderless. There is no queen ant. That doesn't mean they don't need seminary education. It just means they don't know who needs it, so they all need it. <laughs> and a big difference. I said to the board last week, seminary of the people, people seminary. Now, in all of this, while we're slicing and dicing, because it's important, there are right now four tributaries to the river, uh, and Greg, uh, Greg Crawford uh, is the guy who's done this best. There are four tributaries to the river that we recognize as Christianity. By size, the largest, obviously, is Roman Catholicism. Second largest is Protestantism. Third largest is Anglicanism. And fourth largest is Orthodoxy. Now, I say right now because at some point, some uh, sociologist with more presence and credentials than I is very soon, within the next three or four years, going to say, no, there are five. And he or she will be absolutely right. That is Roman Catholicism, Pentecostalism, uh, Protestantism, Anglicanism, and, and uh, Orthodoxy. The reason this matters right here is that for emergence Christianity almost across the board, we have to understand that Roman Catholicism, even though a quarter of emergence, probably emergent Christians, are probably natal Romans, probably have some sort of heritage within the Roman tradition, it still has that cachet of, of being, uh, you know, too priestly, you know, too something or other. We're not going to mess with it. Protestantism isn't what we're rebelling against because that puts too aggressive a word on it, but it sure is what we didn't like. You know, it sure smells. Now, what does that leave if you're trying to find church? If you are, as emergence Christianity is, driven by the need to find out what actually happened in first and second and third century church. What was it like? What, what was the passion there? How do I access it? I access it through Anglicanism because it's the safe one. It's the safe one. One of the funniest things I ever saw happen, Tony Jones is a leader in the emergent part of it, the emergent village, which is way over here. And, and briefly, they tried to organize. And I said when they did it, not that they cared what I said, this is such a mistake. But Tony volunteered to be the executive director. Well, about eight months ago, they decided that was a real mistake. And I said, you think? Uh, you know, for no queen ant, that looks an awful lot like a queen ant. But anyway, Tony, uh, Tony Jones and I <clears throat> were at Calvary Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, simply because that's where I'm uh, a, a, a parishioner, and our, our beloved, beloved priest, uh, Andy Macbeth, really wants what he calls those damn pews unscrewed out of his nave, you know, for a whole lot of really good reasons. There's this old thing about, you know, you don't like the message, you shoot the messenger. Well, his vestry has made it very clear they like the pews. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave them right there. So Andy says to Tony and me, and it was such a setup, I cannot believe we either of us got suckered into it. Anyway, last Lent, and I repented for the rest of Lent, Andy said, will you come in and do a Lenten program at lunch, waffle shop, pre you know, for poor innocent people who just come in to hear something that won't, you know, let them check off they've done a Lenten discipline while they go down and pig out on food, fish pudding, but whatever. Anyway, uh, I have a problem with Lenten disciplines because they're talked about too much, I think. But anyway, so we're up there doing the bit, and we're dying, you know. Uh, we're talking about emergence and what emergent Christianity is all about. And finally, somebody in the, uh, near the back raises her hand and says, Mr. Jones, do you mind that we have a gay bishop? And before he thought about it, Tony said, Hell no, I don't mind you got a gay bishop. I just object all over the place to you having bishops. 
and then he flushed. Uh, Brian McLaurin, uh, who is probably the, the granddaddy, the Martin Luther of emergence Christianity, uh, probably internationally, but certainly in this country, uh, has said publicly he would be a, an Episcopalian, he would be an Anglican uh, if, uh, if he were not going to be emergent. And those of you who were at Lambeth or following Lambeth in any way are aware that it was Mr. McLaurin whom the Archbishop of Canterbury asked to come address uh, the, whole, uh, the whole assembly there for very good reason. There's a very growing, tight relationship between the tradition of Anglicanism. And I hate that, I hate that when I say that word in this country, some, sometimes people hear something. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that Episcopal Church is not a denomination, ladies and gentlemen. It may look like one, talk like one, quack like one, but it's not. It's a part of the Anglican communion, which is one, a distinct tributary into the river of Christianity. And it's the one that's going to matter more in emergence Christianity. And I'm not talking chauvinistically here just because I'm among Episcopalians. It just happens to be true. Uh, and so therefore, while that's lovely, it also lays a certain uh, burden upon us or onus upon us uh, uh, to know what to do with it. So anyway, so uh, we've got Sola Scriptura knocking around here, and we're going to have to deal with it before we take a, a break. As you know, uh, you know, he was, he, old Luther, I seem to be damning him, but that's, um, uh, he was big on solas. Uh, I got him out of order. Fides was whatever. Uh, anyway, and then uh, Solus uh, Christos, uh, Christus, uh, and it's sometimes done in the ablative, as you know, Solo uh, Christo by and through Christ, and then uh, uh, uh Gloria Dei, uh, all things to the glory of God. Now, what uh, Luther was doing uh, was tempering, if you will, this one was El Primo. This one was it. These were the attempt to moderate or explain what this one is about. The fact of the matter is that regardless of how many times you tear the authority down, of how many times you go through one of these 500-year things, authority is going to ultimately be in some way connected to Scripture. And that's where I'm, you can't get rid of it. And, and that really is more a professional conversation than a lay one. <clears throat> so that's where I want to begin after break. Uh, I kept you a little longer than the 20 minutes promised, but it's now 1030. Um, 15 minutes, uh, and uh, we'll cut. I, I really uh, desperately want to uh, get to some Q&A. Uh, um, yeah, I will try to speed it up a little bit. Uh, but I, I, don't get a chance to, I don't get a chance to speak to, to just clergy <coughs> uh, very, very often uh, in, in this sense. And, uh, 